Cool. Give another minute or two. Cool. Um, so I guess I'll get started. I'm Dave. Uh, this is a talk about a reverse engineering tool that I made. Um, if your eyes have already started to glaze over, you can leave. I won't be mad. Room is not empty. Good sign. Um, so a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Dave Kukva. By day, I am a corporate security engineer at a big company. Uh, I'll get the token disclaimer out of the way right now. Uh, everything in this talk is released on my own behalf. Um, I'm here like representing myself, not my employer. Um, so by day I do corporate uh, security and then by night I am a reverse engineer. Uh, I've been working on a game hacking project for about two years now. Uh, I've got nothing better to do with my time, it's fine. Uh, I graduated from the CSEC program last year uh, and I currently live in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, I have a blog at cookfa.co, and I'm also on Twitter at cookfa underscore. Uh, so, let's talk binary analysis. Uh, how many people have heard of IDA before or have used it? A few hands, all right. How many people have paid for like the full version of IDA before? No hands. Awesome. That is my problem. Um, IDA Pro is very, very expensive. Um, a full-fledged license with all the bells and whistles will typically run like multiple thousands of dollars which for hobbyists and people who do this kind of stuff for fun is very very hard to justify like to your significant other or to yourself even when you're spending the amount of money that you can get like a used car for on a piece of software um typically like very hard to justify on the other hand of that, there are professional reverse engineers and people who do this for a living or people who are like extreme reversing enthusiasts who f like for them, when this is maybe like 5% of the profit that they're making or whatever, like they're making a lot of money from reversing, then it's more justifiable. Or if you have a corporate, like a, a big company that's going to shell out, you know, five grand at like the drop of a hat, then yeah, this really isn't like that big of an expense. But for hobbyists, um, it's, it's a big deal to spend that kind of money on tools to pursue your hobby. So um, that's sort of been the problem for the past couple of years. IDA is very expensive, but it's like the best in class. It's really, really good at what it does. And it is like the gold standard reverse engineering. Uh, as of recently, there have been several other products that have begun to challenge that. So we have tools like Radar, we have tools like Hopper, and in my case, Binary Ninja, where there are these open source or very, very cheap uh, comparatively like a hundred dollar license versus like a five grand license um, for reverse engineering tools and for me um, I've been supporting binary ninja I think since it came out of the beta and um, I've been following along but I've always had to resort back to IDA until binary ninja started adding better windows support so they have like a PDB loader now so it works better with debugging symbols um, there's just a lot of gradual improvements and it's really really become like a very powerful tool now in the grand scheme of reverse engineering tools. Um, in my case, uh, so Binary Ninja is inherently a static analysis tool. And in my case, trying to convert from IDA over to Binary Ninja, the one thing that I missed was the ability to switch between uh, static analysis, like looking at your disassembler and just jumping at like the drop of a hat into a debugger and being able to have dynamic analysis. So you can see like the state of your registers, you can see like the state of memory, um, you know, V table calls, all that stuff, like all that dynamic goodness is wrapped into the product where with Binary Ninja, you'd have to run a separate program for that. You have to run your debugger, um, which gets very tiring and there's a lot of manual like back and forth. And I wanted to just 
integrate the two solutions together and just fuse them onto one product, sort of like Ida did. So um, I set out to create that with a Binary Ninja plugin, and I came up with Bindabug, which is a combination of Binary Ninja and Windabug, the debugger. So basically, the plugin will take um, Windabug and use a Py, uh, PyKD, it's called a, like a Python wrapper around the Windabug API, um, in order to combine the two and you get both your stack analysis through Binary Ninja and your dynamic analysis through your debugger. Um, so we sort of supplement like the static information that Binge is really good at with the dynamic information from the debugger. And uh, there's also a bunch of controls and GUI stuff built into Binary Ninja to just have this one like UI, one product again, sort of like Ida does. Um, so this inherently is not really like a novel idea. This has been done before. Um, the two prime examples here are a tool called Bingetron by Snare, which is basically a um, same thing except with a different debugging platform called Voltron, which is a wrapper around a number of other debuggers, um, Windebug included. And um, there's a, more on the UI side, there's a project by an NCC group intern named Eric Hennenfent who made this tool called Binge of Dynamics, which is basically a really cool GUI thing uh, that, again, like solves the dynamic analysis problem with Binja, but then also has like a nice, um, nice fancy UI. Uh, it's more oriented towards people who are new to reverse engineering and just gives more of like a, a GUI, like easy to use feel rather than your ancient like wind debug command line stuff. Um, the problem being is that with both of these solutions, the Windows support is either not there or is lacking. Um, like in my case, there were a lot of hoops to jump through to get up and running on Windows, and I wanted to create something that was just easier to use right out of the box and um, just like show Windows some love, pretty much. So for me, in my case, when I was reverse engineering video games, that's really like a Windows thing. I'm reverse engineering PEs more than any other type of binary, so um, I wanted to create something that was good for Windows. Um, so for the, the plugin itself, um, most of the primary features are just things that integrate within Binary Ninja's uh, GUI. So like, for example, we can launch and control the debugger directly from Binja. Uh, so we get these buttons on top that have your typical debugger controls like start, stop, um, set a breakpoint, um, you know, st step over, step in, step out. Um, and then we can also sync the um, debugger information, like the instruction pointer, directly to the Binary Ninja disassembly graph. So uh, for anyone who's familiar with IDA or with Binary Ninja, you get like a nice graph of all the basic blocks of the program and like all the different functions and everything. They're all very uh, like graphed out. You get a nice pretty graph of where your, um, your control flow of your program goes. Um, but with your disassemble or your debugger with Windebug, you just get like a plain text output of a bunch of instructions, and it's kind of hard to see where the program flow is going to go. So I wanted to combine that into Binja so that you can have the nice, pretty graph, and then also get the dynamic view from your debugger. Um, again, like you can set breakpoints and you can move your instruction pointer directly using the disassembly graph. Um, so like you can just right-click on an instruction and set a breakpoint there you can run the program up to that certain instruction, or you can just have the instruction pointer jump all the way down to that point um, and not execute all the codes. That's like a classic technique for um, getting around like software protections, like your um, you know, enter key code. If you just jump over the function where it asks for the serial and it just runs the rest of the program as normal. Um, question over there? Uh, I think it does all the threads currently. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't know if there's actually support for that at the wind debug level even. Um, but yeah, I, at least in, for, for my case, yeah, it's just all threads. Um, uh, so another solution or another feature here is the, um, the branch decision highlighting. So if you were to reach like a jump instruction, um, when you're looking at just the stack analysis, you don't have the live, like the register view, you're not able to see what's going on. Um, there'd just be this jump here and you wouldn't know whether you would take the jump or whether you'd continue executing down. Um, so what we're able to do with, uh, with Bindabug is take the register views, send that over to Binary Ninja, and then like graphically highlight, like we're not going to take this jump instruction, we're going to highlight green um, where our program's going to go. So we're going to go into this first basic block here instead of taking the jump to the second. and it, highlights that um, in terms of like 
where the instruction pointer is going to go. Um, so I got a nice little demo here, also recorded uh, in case you fall on my face here. But um, so we have Binary Ninja up. This is the um, scroll down here. So this is like the um, the graph of our program. These are like the different basic blocks that will be executed. Um, if we wanted to start our debugging for this example program, um, you can right click and then initialize toolbar. So that's the little uh, control toolbar that I was talking about earlier. You can um, set the process arguments if you have any special arguments you want to pass to the program when it runs. So like for example, for this, um, for this game, you need to do ran from launcher in order for the game to execute. Um, and then you can just hit go up here and it'll spin open the debugger and um, we'll start executing the program. So right now it's loading all the breakpoints that we saved from the last session, um, which takes a little bit. We can open our uh, memory view and a view of the registers here. So we keep those open to the side. Um, I tried integrating this into Binary Ninja itself, but it was a lot easier just to let WinDebug do it because basically you have to send a whole bunch of memory over to Binary Ninja and it was just a big hassle. So it's just easier to sort of keep it out to the side, but keep that information separate from Binja itself. Um, but once this is loaded, we can go over to our example function over here. Bring this up, and we can set a breakpoint over here. Um, cool. So the breakpoint set, and if we go over to our debugger, we can see these these commands that are being back and forth sent back and forth. So um, so far, we have synced the debugger information to Binary Ninja, and we set a breakpoint at this certain address, um, which correlates to this function over here. And uh, now we can just execute the program. And it's going to run until we hit this um, this first place where we set the breakpoint up here. So the yellow over here is our current instruction pointer, and we can just go and step through um, our program as normal here. So one of the cool things that uh, I built in to sort of automate a lot of the manual uh, analysis with reverse engineering is: um, Is anyone familiar with V tables before, or has, has worked with V tables in reversing? Basically, it is. Um, it's basically a, a way that C++ handles polymorphism, and from the static analysis standpoint, um, it's really troubling because, like, you'd see, like, for example, here, you just see like register values, and then down at the bottom here, it goes call edx, and you don't know what edx is, you don't know which function is being called uh, until you're actually executing that program in your debugger. You can't actually tell what it's going to do. Um, and my way of solving this previously was. You just have to run the program in a debugger, go back over to your disassembler, and then comment, like, when I ran this, this was the function that was actually being called. Um, so what I wanted to do with the debugger here was to actually have it, um, like, automatically annotate which functions were being called, uh, which, which functions were being referenced from the V table. So, like, as I execute through this, uh, this function here, it's going to go through and annotate, like, call edx, like this is what was actually called, was this game client states program here, or function here. So um, again, like just automatically executing through, uh, stepping through each of the instructions here, we get like a much better idea of what's actually going on in the program when we go and look at it again from a static analysis standpoint. Um, so we can just like save our analysis file here in, in Binary Ninja and open it back up and see which functions were executed. Um, so we can continue stepping through here and we get to our first branch instruction and we see that we're going to execute here. We're not going to take this jump. Um, so we keep going and it keeps annotating. Um, and we're going to call another vtable function. Um, so let's say we want to just get out of this function entirely. Uh, we can just do run the cursor down here and say that we want to execute up to this point. And then uh, our debugger is just going to go execute all the instructions until it hits this push instruction. Uh, and then we can step the rest of the way out of the function. And uh, our game is going to spin up. So um, just like a quick, brief little demo. Um, again, like this is more of like a hacky script at this point. There's really not much to it. But it's kind of like a, 
just something simple that made my life a hell of a lot easier and really took a lot of uh, that static analysis time that goes into reverse engineering and just automated a lot of it. So uh, a couple lessons learned. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to deal with errors in PyKD, which is one of the underlying technologies that I used in order to implement the uh, debugger API in Python. Um, like a lot of the time that I spent trying to solve these errors was just in the end fixed by just like catching them and just ignoring them, which is kind of like a really bad um, software design decision. But like I found that PyKD is very, very finicky and like it doesn't really, um, like the errors that it throws are just arbitrary for no real reason and they're not very descriptive. So like the best way to handle that was just to catch it and ignore it and everything keeps running as planned, which, um, Again, like I don't really, wasn't really too sure, but that was like the best solution that I found. Um, determining the type of an object in memory using the V tables is not 100% reliable. Um, in the cases of like multiple inheritance, when you have um, like a, a class that would inherit from two other classes, uh, the, basically the V table layout in memory would just have the V table of one of those two classes uh, at, the, at the top of the object. So basically, the way that I used to determine the object type was not 100% reliable, and I was really confused when I hit a case of um, multiple inheritance, like why things weren't matching up. Um, basically, it's an, it's an inexact science. Um, in the end, like trying to do all this stuff on Windows uh, when I had previously worked in like a Linux and Unix environment was very, very strange just because Windows has its own very weird way of doing things, um, specifically in terms of like the named pipes and um, which is how I use to communicate between Binary Ninja and WinDebug and um, just the, the general like Windows API and the com interfaces and stuff like that. Um, it's very strange having come from like a Linux background and um, like in hindsight, I spent all this time making this tool when like looking back on it all, I thought this would just be like a quick weekend project and like six months later, I'm finally like releasing the tool. Um, it would have been easier just to like improve Windows support on existing solutions rather than try and do everything my way. Sorry, Elvis, but uh, yeah, I would have saved a hell of a lot of time if I would have just have tried to improve existing solutions instead of making my own, I think. But um, now that I made this thing and I kind of like it, I'm just gonna keep going down the road. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, the, all the code is up on GitHub at this point. Um, I just released the tool all of like 24 hours ago. So it's probably very bug ridden and very, um, I mean, it's extremely hacky. So like, please go and find issues in this and let me know so I can fix them. But um, yeah, that's all I have for you guys. Um, any questions? Yeah, John. Then I'm not sure. I think you're talking about the demo version. Yeah. I think I think you can. Um, I know the licenses are still very cheap compared to like a like an IDA license. Um, it's I think there's like a ninety nine dollar uh, intro license, like a student license or like a hobbyist license. Um, and I know there's tons of giveaways all the time at like conferences and stuff. But yeah, for the for the free version, I'm not sure about that. Any other questions? Yeah. So is there a, you kept talking about the pipe KD. Is there an alternative to that? Um you can so the Pi KD stuff is basically a wrap around the C uh, debugger engine that comes with like the Windows SDK. Um, so it's basically just like an easier way to call those functions. Um, like if I wanted to, I could have made everything in like C, which would have been like a little bit harder. Uh, it just would have been like more development effort basically. Um, so like, yeah, we could just call like the Windows API directly and just like interface with it that way, but it was kind of easier just to have like the Python wrap around, or at least I thought it would be easier until it started freaking out on me every um, every command I tried to run. But um, yeah, like there's, there are other solutions there, but they're, they're more difficult to use. Cool, yeah. Question from the uh, internet, totally real. Uh, can you show us how to cheat a video game? Um, I don't have any demos prepared. Um, There's lightning talks later. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'll throw something together. Um, no, like, I guess like the, I can I can point to some good resources. Um, there's a book by Nick Cano who talks about a lot of um, 
like a whole bunch of very like applicable um, game hacking like techniques, trends, like all the background information that I skipped over um, when, I, when I was talking about all this stuff. Um, I would totally recommend that book. Um, there's lots of um, like Live Overflow is a really good like live streamer that goes over a bunch of this stuff. Um, um, yeah, I don't really have anything on hand that I can show, but um, this like this tool is made for game hacking, so there's definitely like it's applicable to that. <laughs> but I don't have anything uh, that I can give offhand. Cool. Thanks, guys.